When I first started researching splitboarding, I literally had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what they meant by pucks, what types of bindings would fit with the pucks, different skins. So I'm making this video specifically for that person. By the end of this video, you're gonna have a great understanding of not only what gear to buy, but also where to go and do your first splitboarding adventure. Now, the biggest thing with splitboarding that keeps people away from it is the fact that it's a steep investment fee. And what I mean by that is a lot of the gear is expensive upfront, but the longer that you have this gear and the longer that you actually stay splitboarding, the more that investment is going to be worth to you. All right, so let's start with the big four pieces of gear that you need in order to go splitboarding. All of these links are gonna be in the description below, so make sure to check them out. Number one, the first thing that you need is obviously a board. Now, you'll see here it has what's called pucks, and the pucks are what your number two thing that you need is your bindings are going to slide onto. So pucks are just a mounting mechanism for your binding. Now, there's different types of pucks, but the most common ones are volet and most of the bindings that you're gonna find that use a regular boot are going to be compatible with that mounting system. Now, your board is going to be a little bit different than obviously a traditional resort board. It's gonna probably be a little more stiff because you're gonna need it for skis on the uphill. There's gonna be different types of brackets on there such as crampon mounting brackets and brackets for where your feet are gonna go. Obviously the biggest difference is that it's cut in between and you can use it as skis on the uphill and then you put it together going down. So next, you're gonna look at bindings. You want split board specific bindings. Your regular snowboard bindings are not going to do the trick and the reason is is because these are made to mount on and off of those pucks. They just slide on. They also have what's called a riser in the back and this is for on the uphill, you have particularly steep sections this will decrease your stride length but help you stay upright to make sure you're actually getting up and keep going up on those hills the next thing you want is gonna be your boots when you get into boots you have kind of a few different option of boots your resort boots there's kind of in between split board specific boots but then there's also what's called hard boots so you can definitely use your resort boots at first which is what I did actually my first year and just make sure that they're very stiff but because 95% of the time of split boarding you're actually going uphill you're gonna want something that is made to go uphill and maybe kind of sacrifices some of the riding comfortability what I got this year was called the Jones MTB and this is a split board specific boot. This is kind of between a resort boot and a hard boot setup but what's really neat about these is that it allows you to get more of your stride length by having a, I don't know what you would even call this, an adjustable heel so you have a longer stride length. You can also get a hard boot setup. Uh, the reason I don't have it yet is because you have to get different bindings and you have to get different boots obviously, and that's very, very expensive just in and of itself. And so I'll probably be trending that way, but for right now, what I have is good for me. Now then you're going to need skins. And yeah, I'm probably gonna get a lot of for this because first of all, I lost my skin bag, but regardless, these are Burton G3s and these have been great for me. Now, some skins are gonna be better at gripping and going uphill, while some skins are gonna be better at gliding. These ones have provided a really good mix for me, although, albeit I haven't used any other skins before. When you order skins, you're gonna find out that they are not the actual size of your split skis. So what you'll actually receive with the skins, a basically a knife to cut them, and you basically just trace it around your skis. Now, these should last a long time, but you really wanna take care of them, and that means not getting them dirty, not dropping them in the snow, not getting hair on them. When At the end of your trip, you wanna make sure that you're drying them and then storing them. Now that's kind of the bare minimum of what you need to go splitboarding. But before you even go splitboarding, you actually need even more gear, and that is going to be avalanche specific gear. One of the first things you should do when you are beginning splitboarding is taking an actual avalanche course and also reading this book by Bruce Tremper. You definitely need to be knowledgeable because most of the time when you're splitboarding, you're gonna be outside of resort boundaries where you really need to have the knowledge of how avalanches occur and how to dig someone out of an avalanche if you were god forbid to be in one see that just went so some of the main gear that you need in order to even start going split boarding would be a beacon shovel and a probe now what a beacon does is it essentially is going to turn on and transmit your signal 
to someone. So before you actually start going on your split boarding adventure, you turn these on, you sync it with your partner. If you are in an avalanche, they are able to hopefully find you by tracking you with their own beacon. Now, if you just have the beacon and your partner doesn't have a beacon, that makes no sense because nobody's gonna be able to actually find you. You will be transmitting a signal, but nobody is gonna be there to pick it up. So you both need to have a beacon and you need to make sure that you're testing it out before you go. And then the other two things you need is a probe and a shovel. So now I'm gonna be going over this very basically, but this is kind of like how an avalanche sequence works out. And for all the comments that are gonna be like, again, this is just a basic rescue scenario and how this stuff would work. So the next thing that you do is you grab out your probe and then you probe down to try and find your partner. And once you hit a strike, then you're gonna start digging with your shovel. So all of this is gonna fit in your pack. It sounds like a shovel would be big, but it actually they're super small, they're super light. Same with the probe. And these are things that you're you always need to have with you no matter what when you're in the backcountry. As a snowboarder, what I really recommend is some type of Z folding pole instead of a static trekking pole. And the reason why is because if you've ever tried to stuff a big trekking pole in your already full backpack, you basically look like you're snowboarding with antennas and you look pretty freaking lame. So I like to have some type of folding trekking pole. The other thing you might consider is getting what's called a whippet. And what a whippet is, is basically a trekking pole. However, it's got an ice axe attachment that you can then put put on it and screw into it and it would act like an ice axe. If you're in territory that you don't really think you need an ice axe for, but maybe you should, this is a really good option for you because you don't have to bring your actual ice axe and add more weight to your entire kit. The other thing you want to look for in trekking poles is to have some sort of lip on it. And the reason you want a lip is because when you are flipping your risers back and forth for the different types of terrain, you want to have that lip to be able to grab the riser and be able to flip it up or flip it down very easily instead of having you bend down, do it, and then stand back up, which can be very tiring if you're doing that a lot on flat and then steep and then flat again terrain. Now I know why I don't ever put these in the bag. Then we have split crampons. These just simply are gonna go underneath your bindings and these are great for when it's icy or it gets too steep just for your skins to stick. The other thing you want is what's called a volet strap and these are just amazing, amazing little things to have in the backcountry simply because skins can get too wet and they don't stick to your board anymore so you have to use them to strap the, the skin back to your board, or you can use them as a makeshift binding. All of these things I've actually had to do before, and bull lace straps are something that you're always gonna see in the backcountry with snowboarders and split boarders because of just how versatile they are. And then the last thing that I would say with this is you definitely want a helmet. I'm a big helmet proponent and it's just a no brainer, literally. Real quick on clothing. If you're a snowboarder, you're primarily really used to riding in a resort. So you're wearing a lot of layers, you're wearing very warm gear. In split boarding, what I like to do is not wear resort type of gear. And the reason is because you're moving uphill a lot. So when you go to strip your big heavy resort jacket, you try to stuff it in your bag and it's just not packable. You kind of want to think about different types of lighter weight gear. One of the best things that I think for in terms of coats is having some sort of windbreaker like waterproof shell, like my Patagonia coat that I have. This is great because it has venting, but also gives you a waterproof shell and packs down super easy. Now the one drawback to wearing a shell like that is the fact that it doesn't have a snow skirt. One of the things we'll talk about a little bit later is actually putting your skins when you're going downhill next to your body to keep them warm so they don't ice up and if you do this with your coat but you don't have a snow skirt on it you can definitely fall to the ground as you're snowboarding and you have no idea so one of the things I like to do to remedy that is wear bibs and tuck them into my bibs. The number one thing though that you wanna remember with this is you wanna be bold and start cold. Now there's a hundred other videos about how to layer in winter, so I'm not gonna go over that, but one of the main things is you wanna make sure that you are not working up too much of a sweat because it's gonna come back to bite you when you get up to your transition spot and you have to go downhill. Now let's get into actual field tips. And some of these things actually took me like almost a full year to figure out. Learning these things ahead of time is gonna give you a big jump. The first thing you must know is that you have to subscribe and like this video. And as a thank you for that, here's a video of my skiing friend not being able to get up over a hill. Just go up. Jesus. Yeah, just go up. 
The first place that you probably want to practice split boarding is inbounds at an actual ski resort. A lot of ski resorts have things that are called uphill policies. So go to the website, look up their uphill policy. They usually have certain designated trails and routes that you can do to go uphill. You're gonna get a lot of crazy looks from people and you're gonna be able to count on like three hands how many people say, you're going the wrong way. But yeah, this is a really good place to start because you get used to a lot of the transitions. So what transitions are, are simply from going to climbing to then ride mode. One of the most common mistakes that I find is people always having their risers up too far. You wanna actually make sure that you keep your risers down as much as possible, in my opinion, just because every time you put these up, it's going to decrease your stride length, making you a little bit less efficient. But again, it just depends on how steep the terrain is. Another common mistake is people not leaning back to trust their skins. Typically people will lean forward as they think that's gonna provide them the most traction when they get on something steep, but actually their skis end up slipping out. You actually need to lean back and have your chest up in the air to make sure that you're getting the weight on your skins to actually allow you to go uphill. Another thing that I used to do for the longest time was I tried to put my board together on the ground, but it's a lot easier to put your board together to put it into ride mode if you're actually holding it in the air and then fitting it as a puzzle piece. And speaking of the board, when you're going uphill, you actually wanna have the skis as opposite sides. And that enables you to actually use a little bit more of an edge when you're trying to traverse on the snow. And then we talked a little bit about storing skins, but one of the best ways to actually store your skins when you're in the field is actually folding them together and then putting them in your bibs to keep them warm so they don't ice up, which then if they get ice on it, then they typically will end up falling off of your skis. When you start to transition into the backcountry, like I said before, you definitely need to make sure that you're taking an avalanche course and making sure you're, sure you're as educated on avalanches as possible. You also wanna bring your stance actually way more back than when you ride in the resort. This took me an entire year to figure out. Coming from the Midwest, I really didn't really ride powder that much. And so I would have a regular stance on there. And when we would ride powder in the backcountry, my nose would constantly be diving and I would be falling constantly because my nose was just never out of the snow. After moving my stance backwards, it has been almost a night and day difference how much better I can actually ride powder or just even that kind of in between between powder or even just corn. Which leads me to another thing. When you start split boarding in the spring, one of the best ways to actually get what's called corn snow and to ride that is to actually wait till a little bit later in the afternoon to where the sun warms up the snow and the, the snow almost kind of becomes a little bit slushy, but it's great to ride. It's absolutely great to ride, but you have to be aware of wet, loose avalanches. So make sure you're reading the avalanche report and you're not on avalanche terrain for that type of stuff. Pick your transition points carefully. You wanna make sure that you're on a flat piece of ground to make the transition from climb mode to ride mode because otherwise trying to take off your skis on a very steep part is gonna be extremely dangerous. And the other thing that you risk is your ski actually flying down the mountain. Oh my God. No, dude, no, 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 no. You need to make sure that you're securing all of your gear when you're making your transition because all too often I've lost so much stuff by just kind of forgetting that you're on an incline and you set it down and then all of a sudden it sails away. And then make sure you're not just going straight up the mountain. There's a reason why you see skin trails and they kind of go like this. And that's because going straight up the mountain sometimes isn't the most efficient and is super easy for you to actually fall and slip down. So when you're actually making kind of these S curves, like little traverses, one of the things you need to learn about is called a kick turn. I'm not gonna go over that in here. There's a plenty of other videos that I'll link up here to that go over that. It's a really good technique to learn that'll take some practice to learn, but is ultimately a valuable technique when you're in the backcountry. If you want more exclusive tips like these as I kind of start figuring them out, Make sure you subscribe to my newsletter down below, completely free. And then also as you're planning your next split boarding adventure, make sure you go down in the description below and pick up my free hiking, outdoor goals and itinerary slash packing list planner. Absolutely amazing, been hearing a lot of good stuff about it. Again, all the links to everything that I talked about is gonna be in the description. Keep building, we'll see you for the next one.